Hi and welcome back to a new video. You can see on my table we are going to do some testing with the C490 Aoros Extreme Water Force. About a month ago we already did a preview about the board, a quick look on the monoblock and the features the board has, also VRM and everything. But we were not allowed to do any real testing yet because it was still under embargo. Now we are free to do whatever we want. She goes up. But now we are free to do whatever we want and that's exactly what we're going to do. We will test my best 10900K so far and see what we can get out of the CPU in terms of like Cinebench max clock. And uh, we are going to use the chiller which I still have at Case King. I think we did some video content with my chiller about two or three years ago. But since then I haven't been featuring my chiller on this channel. I think... Yeah, before I go to Case King, I have to play around with Sheik to keep her happy and entertained. Anyway, first thing, a uh, detailed look on how we're going to assemble the water block and then some chiller action. The chiller can go as low as 3 degrees Celsius, can dissipate a maximum of 4000 watt. That should be sufficient even for a 10900K. But first of all, let's assemble everything. Starting off with putting the CPU into the socket, then we have two times M.2 drives because I'm not sure which OS is on which SSD right now at the moment. And then I'm going to use one of those kits, G-Skill Dryden CRGB 4266C19 will try to tighten the timings a little bit, maybe run 40, maybe run 4133 megahertz with a little bit tighter timings. Should be a solid base. All right, here we go. CPU into the socket. Also removing the foil on the thermal pad. Not going much into detail because we already covered this in the previous video. Inlet, outlet, it's also written on it in case you're not sure. Basically cooling the entire CPU, VRM and also network chip. Obviously also the chipset right here on the bottom. What I absolutely appreciate about this monoblock is the fact that all the thermal pads are already in place. So you don't have to place them yourself, that's quite convenient. Just have to remove the protective film everywhere, depending where you need it. We will need it on the bottom two M.2 slots, we will leave it on here. Uh, have to remove it from chipset, VRM part and obviously also network chip. Usually it's also covered in thermal paste right here for the CPU part, but I had to remove it because it was already mounted once for the previous video, but then removing it I spotted something quite unusual or very interesting. Now while I keep moving my camera, please pay attention to the contact surface that makes contact with the CPU itself. You will see that it's a little bit convex, which is really interesting. I'm trying that you can see it. You can kind of see it by the reflections. I hope you can judge. Yeah, I think it should be, should be visible. And that's something I didn't see before on monoblocks. I saw it before on normal CPU blocks, which makes sense. So it has perfect contact in the middle of the CPU where you really need the contact, not like on the outside of the IHS. And usually for monoblocks, if they have bad tolerances, then they wouldn't make perfect contact with the CPU, but rather with like VRM part. And this way, this should be quite nice for CPU contact. Last step is applying thermal paste on the CPU. At home, you can usually skip this step because thermal paste is pre-applied on the monoblock. And unless you remove it before, you don't have to use your own thermal paste. One part I'm not really a fan of is connecting the wires. We have one connector on the bottom near the PCH and one on top near the CPU socket right here. Cable on the monoblock, another cable on the monoblock. And you can see they're not that long. Therefore, it's a little bit of a hassle to connect both cables and then at the same time make sure that the monoblock is perfectly placed while trying to put no tension on the cables because you don't want to tear them apart. Therefore, I would have appreciated if it would just be one cable for both lighting parts instead of having two, which are not that long. Anyway, let's try to fit on the monoblock. Mm -hmm. 
The manual is well detailed, something I appreciate. We already finished the first two steps, placement of thermal pads, also placement of the block itself. First step when it comes to the screws is attaching the small screws in the M.2 slots, right what you can see on the bottom left here. The next step are the screws for the CPU followed by VRM and the last step are the screws for the PCH. Bundle is assembled, ready to go. I also did a weight measurement because after assembling I thought wow this is heavy and I figured out this is 4.6 kilogram and that, that is really quite heavy and uh, should be quite a lot of copper inside the monoblock and kind of explains what you're paying for with this thing. Okay, should be ready to go. I will make my way up to Case King and then we'll be back. And here we are at Case King. On my side you can see the chiller I'm really interested in who can remember this thing. I think it was like a Titan X project three years ago or something like that. Haven't been using it much since. Everything is prepared so far. The tank inside the chiller is empty right now. It contains 15 liters. We will have to fill it up with distilled water and then add a little bit of DP Ultra from Aqua Computer to protect the components. Then we will have to connect the pump, it's a dual DDC laying and the bundle itself is also ready to go on the table. I'll just show you the stuff uh, in close-up. We will have to fill the chiller from the top right here, that's the tank. On the bottom we have the connections for the pump, which is sitting right here. There's uh, 15 liters of distilled water, I think we even have 20, depends on how much we will need. And a bundle ready on the table, only have to connect water cooling, adapters, memory is in place, GPU is in place and we're almost good to go. Loop is complete, everything is up and running. As I said before, there's the chiller, we have the tank inside with about 15 liters of chilled water. Then we have a dual DDC, which is going to the system, already did some basic benchmarks. We're going to look at them in a second. And on here we have the chiller control. It's using an Aqua Arrow and the Aqua Suite software from Aqua Computer. And we have a two point controller on the bottom. Currently it's set to keep the temperature between 28 and 20 degrees Celsius, currently 25 degrees Celsius. And whenever it hits 28, it will start to work and chill the water down to 20 degrees Celsius. We can set this down to up to three degrees Celsius. Uh, I'm not sure how deep we will go, but that's the current setting. And here we have the setup, tubes are connected, water is running through. Currently running 4133 on a memory C16, nothing spectacular, 5 GHz on the cache, also 5 GHz on the core, 1.3 volt, just to test basic stability, 6600 points almost in R20. Did a quick ADA64 run as well, just to check stability. And from this point on we will try how high we can push the CPU. First of all, reconfigure the chiller. We will keep it between 16 and 13 degrees Celsius for the start. I hope you can hear it. It's actually not that loud. Considering the performance of this thing, I think it's okay. You could place it in just a room next door and then should be fine. Cooling would be really great. Right now we still have a water temperature of about 25 degrees Celsius. And the result is CPU core temperature in the mid 70s to peak 79 degrees Celsius. That looks nice, 12.8 degrees Celsius. Yeah, I think we can work with that. And already just looking at the core temperatures between 15 and 19 degrees Celsius in idle, those are nice temperatures. 
For OC, we're using the Gigabyte Tweak Launcher. Simply just check the box at cores and uncore, putting the core at 53, uncore at 52. That should be stable at the given temperature and also voltage. And then apply. 5.3 GHz, 1.33 volts, almost uh, 7,000 points in R20. Peak temperature was yeah in the high 60s to 70 degree on core 2, even with chilled water at like 13, 14 degrees Celsius, still hitting the 70s. 10900 k is definitely hot. I had to lower the uncore to 51. 52 was not entirely stable. Now trying 55 on the core. 5.5 not working so far. It didn't really matter if I increase voltage, means it's just getting way too warm. Therefore, I will lower the water temperature. And you can see even 5.4 GHz is not stable at the given voltage and temperature. I will try to lower the temperature and then maybe we can do 5.4. It turns out not to be that easy as I expected. I'm still struggling to run 5.4. I mean, I'm also running fairly high memory speed and cache speed. Therefore, the CPU is definitely getting warm, 1.36 volt. I'm currently lowering the water temperature to 9 degrees Celsius. I already have condensation on the block, uh, which is typically a sign to either start insulating or stop. Right now we will just keep going until we hit 9 degrees Celsius water temperature and then give it a last try to do 5.4 because I've been sitting here for about two and a half hours trying to get 5.4 stable. It's a little bit tricky. Not sure why I thought the CPU would be that great, but it's not that great. But also we're running R20, which is ABX and therefore maybe my expectations were a little bit too high with ABX. Let's just uh, see what happens when we have 9 degrees Celsius water temperature and then see if it works. That's just an example of the condensation on this fitting on a pump. Should look similar on the block of the mainboard itself and that could be the problem or it could become a problem if there will be too much condensation and it drops down onto some solder pads or whatever then it could be a short circuit and that's something we want to avoid. That looks promising. Unfortunately still couldn't manage to break 7,000 points in R20. It's just getting too warm. Even if I would increase the coal voltage further to like 1.4 volt, it's just getting warmer and warmer. And you can see we're already back in the region of about 70 degrees Celsius at 5.4. I mean, 5.4 on 10 cores is certainly not bad. I expected or hoped for 5.5. Unfortunately, that didn't work out. Yeah, unfortunately, no 5.5. I was really hoping to get 5.5, but turned out to be more difficult on the CPU uh, than expected. Again, running R20 with ABX. Maybe it's not as bad as I'm thinking. Maybe if you have one of those CPUs out there, maybe just post underneath what kind of frequencies or scores you are running right now. And uh, yeah, I was hoping to show you more, but unfortunately didn't work out. Otherwise, the board is running great. Um, if you're owning one of those boards, doesn't matter if it's the Waterforce version or the normal version, then I can absolutely recommend the GTL tool because it's much easier. You don't have any weird services running in the background. You can just enter core, uncore. You can even change the voltages on the fly. Very handy tool for overclocking. I think I will link it down in the description if I can find a download link somewhere. Otherwise, can absolutely recommend those boards running absolutely smooth. Thanks for tuning in and see you next time. Bye. And here on the monoblock, definitely some condensation going on. More on the fittings, but also on the side of the monoblock and on the copper. Should be the right time to just stop.